Good evening and welcome to this pre-concert commentary or pre-concert talk with KHFM. I'm Brant Stevens. Thanks for joining us. If you like to get up early, you can join me every weekday starting at around 6 a.m. on weekday mornings with Brent. Uh, so many things to hear and listen to during the week, the Metropolitan Opera on the weekends. Uh, one of the things I'm very excited about right now will be coming up on the last of them. Classic American icons were playing film music leading up to the Oscars, so we'll have our last opportunity for an evening of wonderful film music this Friday night. That's hosted by John Michael Luther. I'd like to thank you for coming to the pre-concert commentaries. Um, you can always hear interviews with the artists on KHFM, and you can find them on our website under the interviews, but this is a great chance to uh, learn a little bit more about the piece. It's like a, an extended program notes live in front of you, and I always think that makes a piece so much uh, more enjoyable. I'm going to set down my water here and uh, welcome our conductor for the evening, Maestro Grant Cooper. So let's take the program in order. Um, Franz Schubert, 25 when he started this symphony. Franz Schubert was living at the same time as Beethoven. Do you think that that had any influence on the way he was approaching his symphony? Surely, Beethoven's uh, lifetime spanned a very important aspect of, of music history from the classical period into the early Romantic period as composers discovered ways to express uh, themselves, the, the artistic creator at the, at the heart of a, of a piece of music as opposed to a more um, classical piece of music that was just more about the form and, and, the, uh, and the musical materials. And Beethoven's music also invited each one of you to be the person who was experiencing the artistic journey. So that's an important aspect of what romantic music was doing. Schubert was uh, born about 20 some years after Beethoven, uh, but grew up in Beethoven's Vienna and was exposed to Beethoven's music and revered Beethoven's music as most cultured musicians did at the time. Uh, but he survived Beethoven only by one year. He died in Isn't 1828. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. And this particular piece was written in 1822, but wasn't heard until 1865, 43 years after Schubert's death. Um, and in fact, he made no particular efforts to get the piece performed. And as we know, it's an unfinished symphony. He made no particular efforts to finish it either. And that reasons for that are, um, are many. They're very complicated. It's not worth going into right now because no one knows for sure what actually happened. Uh, there the there was a little bit more of program material for it. He had, I think, finished a piano sketch of a scherzo and maybe started to orchestrate a little bit of that. Exactly. There's a piano sketch, and most of that is orchestrated, not all of it. Uh, but most of it is, and um, just a little clue that might be a clue to, to why this will happen is that this, the, the piece is cyclic. That means that each of the movement's themes are related to each other. There's a sense of, of one piece of cloth being used to cut the themes for all the movements. That goes for the third movement as well, the one that's sketched that you referred to. And uh, Schubert had played a, um, a performance of Beethoven's Second Symphony uh, in his teens, his early teens, so he knew Beethoven's symphony, Second Symphony uh, intimately, and it just turned out that the cyclic application of the thematic material he was using to the scherzo or the, or the third movement almost exactly replicated Beethoven's Second Symphony. And he was <clears throat> a lifelong, uh, it was an, a lifelong fear of his that he'd be uh, charged with plagiarism. And so he probably, seeing these, uh, these similarities, just put the piece away and went on on with his compositional life, never to return to it. Never return to the symphony. Of course, of course, composed, what was he, he was working on a lot of stuff at the time. He was also going to die young, and I think around the time of the symphony, he was aware that he was uh, sort of coming towards the end of his Let's life. Let's just right? say that he did not take care of his body. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now let's explore the connection between Schubert's unfinished symphony and Mahler's symphony. Uh, Schubert in the, uh, uh, what, 18, around 1820, so something like, uh, not quite a century later, Mahler comes along. Mahler, known in his day as one of the great conductors, but always was fighting for time uh, to, f to find time to compose, much like Leonard Bernstein in the last century. Well, Mahler's symphonies are well known. You're going to hear one of the great Mahler symphonies tonight on tonight's program. But he was also very, very interested in the German lied, German song, which he would compose for 
singer and piano, and many of them are orchestrated, and we hear them in our concert programs today. As an inheritor of the great German song tradition, uh, he certainly knew the great body of Schubert's songs, and maybe that's Schubert's greatest claim to musical fame, is his incredible ability to capture the essence of a song's poetry in the music and to set it uh, sublimely. So Mahler, as a consummate musician and a composer of songs, would have known Schubert's main body of work really well. We also know that there's a set of parts in the music library at, of the Vienna Philharmonic of Schubert's Ninth Symphony, reorchestrated by Mahler in the style of the current day. In fact, there's a set of parts of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony as well, with eight horns and tuba. Uh, so, so Mahler was very interested in bringing these pieces up to date into the modern times not at all like we often approach music today where we try to recreate the sound of the, of the um, original, of an original performance if it ever existed, of course. But, but the other thing is that in Schubert's songs, there's, a, there's many, many times that he plays on the, uh, the alteration, alternation of major and minor. And that's one of the key motivic elements in this piece. It happens in every movement, um, although in, this, in, this, in the slow movement, there's actually a place where it goes from A flat minor to A flat major in a, in a and it's, and it's beautiful uh, reversal of that sequence. But this falling from major to minor is the kind of the, 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 the main uh, motto, if you will, of, of Mahler's Ninth Symphony, and it's one of the things you hear in Schubert all the time too, which is why my musical mind goes towards pairing Schubert with Mahler. The last time I, I did this particular Mahler symphony, I did the Schubert Fifth Symphony, because I wanted to highlight this very classical Fifth Symphony of, of Schubert with the gargantuan orchestra of Mahler. This time, I decided that there was actually a musical reason to pick the unfinished symphony, and we'll reveal that musical reason to you at, at the concert. Now, Mahler, uh, at the time he composed this, trying to get away from the pressures of being a conductor, he'd found a retreat on a lake to compose and composed this over the course of two summers. So he was happy, as far as we know. He was newly married, although they were I guess he and Alma, two sort of intellectual titans going at each other, maybe the, the George and Martha of their maybe day. Maybe they were just experiencing married life. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, would, they would have a child. So with, with what should have been so much happiness around him, contentment in his life, what is it that drove him to this symphony? Well, I think we, we have to cast ourselves back to the Fantasiecle of Vienna, Viennese society, uh, what was going on in, in the world, which is what Vienna was at that point, it was the center of the world, uh, in psychoanalysis, for example. Sigmund Freud was just developing his, his theories of psychoanalysis. Um, the, the coming to the understanding that on one side of a, of a ball, if you look at it from another angle, you see something completely different, something light, something very dark. And I think there are many times that we can trace in the biography of any given composer the complete reversal of what they're experiencing in their life is being in their, expressed in their music at that time. It's like it's, it's, a, it's a vent, it's a salve, it's a, it's a way to escape. Now, why would you escape from the bright side to the dark side? Well, because um, Mahler knew that this was there. He, he wasn't going to just pretend like Pollyanna that everything, everything was great. He knew that there was a dark side to life. And he was certainly about to experience it. I do believe that the chronology of, of, of his life and what happened to him, his, the anti-Semitism at the, at the opera, his heart condition, these things have been conflated by, um, by biographers and moved conveniently earlier. Uh, and they actually happened a little bit later after, after this piece was written, including the Kindertoten leader, for example, the Songs on the Death of Children, and his daughter was to die just w within uh, a, a few short years of, of the composition of this piece. So he was uh, almost but, anticipating. Well, he, he, I think he was just, if, if you see this here, then you want to write, write about this here. You know, that's the artistic thing. You don't write about the ordinary. Entertainment and art are different. Entertainment is when you reinforce what we already know. Art is when you explore what we don't know. So it makes sense that an artist would take what they are experiencing and then try to express the opposite of it. I think that makes a lot of sense. The other thing that's worth mentioning, too, is that Mahler had written three of these movements in 1903. He came to his summer hut, compositional hut, in 1904, and he looked at his 
unfinished symphony. He had an unfinished symphony at this point. And uh, the little reveal that we'll do for you at the concert is a real aha moment as to how he correlates that and makes me start even more to think of Schubert. So let's talk about the structure of the movements. The first three movements, um, are they thematically tied together? That depends on how much you, you want to dig, but absolutely. It's a big piece. There are many themes. So it's not always one theme that you hear in every movement, like bom, ba ba bom, ba ba bom, bom, Tchaikovsky's symphony that has that theme in every single movement, blatant. It's either in the minor or the major, but it's, it's blatantly there. In, in Mahler's case, it's more Beethoven-like in that he uses themes that are only two or three or four notes long. So you can't kind of get, you can't get caught up into the emotional content of the theme. You are more interested in, well, what happens to these four notes? Sometimes they go backwards, for example. So yes, there, there are elements uh, which are very, very strongly expressed in, in the symphony, but there are some very, this is interesting about composition. Composition is a very complicated task, but it doesn't have to be rocket science. Sometimes very simple ideas. So for example, the first theme of the first movement is bee, bom, bom, ba, bee, bom. Bee, ba, 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 bom, ba, dee, dom. It's almost always going down. And then the second theme, which was supposed to represent Alma, his wife, ba dee da dee, ba dee da dum, da da dum, da dee da dee, da 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 dum, da da, ba dee da dum, da dee da dum, da dee da dum, is constantly reaching upwards. So the simple idea of a descending theme representing uh, fate, tragedy, and an ascending theme representing hope. It's, it's so simple. Why couldn't you or I think of it and, and write this piece? Um, but that, that, that sort of idea um, is probably more powerfully expressed in the, in the piece as a cyclic element. We spoke about how Schubert Unfinished is a cyclic piece with the themes being related to each other in each movement. How many, how many musicians do you have on stage tonight? It's uh, I haven't counted them because I would be afraid that they'd ask me to pay for it. I, don't <laughs> <laughs> I, w I would guess there's 80, 85. So was Mahler uh, a, a groundbreaker in expanding the size of the orchestra to, to sort of match his grand vision? He was the conductor of the Vienna State Opera and a great interpreter of the operas of Richard Wagner, so I'd have to answer that question, no. He was, he was, that, that was what it was about at that time. That's why today it's so difficult for us to afford to do these pieces, Bruckner's symphonies. Th those guys were just writing for the, the, the salaried court musicians of the Vienna State Opera. They had two horn sections, eight horns totally, so just write for eight horns if it's a, they're not alternating night by night at the opera, which is why they have the two orchestras to make the workload spread out a little bit. So we write a symphony, we write for eight horns, and, um, the Mahler's big contribution is, is, is back in here, which is a bit dark for you right now, but that's lined with percussion, and there was much critical um, humor pointed at, at Mahler over his use of, of the percussion section. And in fact, he, he made so many revisions to all of his symphonies, and almost, you can say, 40 to 50 percent of, of the revisions in any given symphony is reducing the amount of percussion. He, hmm. he really tended in his musical mind to overestimate the, um, the, the, the way the percussion would add to the sound, it just tended to obliterate it. So he revised heavily after he heard and, and actually rehearsed his own music, but he never changed a note of the form or of the melodic content or of the harmonic content of, of the piece. It could be a 90-minute piece and, and it's the same from beginning to end in terms of the music itself. The only things that change mostly is the orchestration, um, and also then some rhythmic notation occasionally, some clarification and, and so on. So there's an enormous amount of information we get from Mahler's conducting scores, which then we have to reconcile with um, his original conception. And interestingly in this piece, the Mahler's Sixth Symphony, he perhaps rather foolishly uh, allowed the score to be uh, published in a study score before the first performance. Which is completely unlike him. Well, that's because he knew he would, he would be revising the piece so, so 
so readily. And indeed, by the first performance, he had already reversed the order of the first of the second and third movements. Let's let's talk. We talked about that the other day, but let's talk about that. There's a choice in where the movements fall. Where do you? Where do the movements fall for you, and why? Well, he originally composed the piece with the opening, the, the grand sonata form opening movement, followed by the scherzo, followed by the andante, the more lyrical movement, with the finale at the end. The fact is the material between the um, first and second movements is very, very, very similar. And so he had a whole group of people hanging around him. He was the most famous musician in the world, you have to remember this, and, and young composers and conductors would just want to be around Mahler to, for it to rub off on them or maybe to get some sort of position or something like that. And these people were advising Mahler all through the performances of, of this particular symphony. Um, they were saying, oh, it's, it's too unrelenting, there needs to be a, a release after that gargantuan first movement, the, second, the slow movement should go second. Um, the fact is that the first, the, this, I, I sp spoke earlier of the a major, A minor, it turns out to be A major, A minor alteration, alternation that occurs in the tragic symphony of Mahler. The first movement ends in A major and the second movement begins in A minor as he composed it. So he has written structurally that, that, that motto becomes a structural guide, uh, an architectural plan, part of the architectural plan. That's pretty powerful reasoning. And then the slow movement he wrote in E-flat major, which is a remote key, but that's good because the emotion is remote. And then the last movement spends quite a bit of time, several minutes, negotiating from the key area of E-flat back to A minor. So from a composer's point of view, there's a very strong, logical, harmonic progression through the entire piece if you follow his original order. Now, when he conducted it, did he conduct it in that order? No. No, because these, these people that were, were kissing up to him, if you, if you excuse the expression, were, were, were saying, oh, you, it, there's, there's too much doom and gloom, you need this one um, in, in the other place. And, and Mahler was insecure enough, and superstitious enough for that matter, um, to, to take note of all of these things and, and perform the piece in this, in this other order. Um, I, I don't think it makes sense. I think that there are two scores available to us for Mahler 6. The score of Mahler as the conductor and the score of Mahler as the composer. And I choose to go back to the original compositional idea because I think it's so powerful and perform the score that Mahler the composer wrote, not the score that Mahler the conductor conducted. Now let's come to the hammer. What, uh, what does this represent in, in, in this work and in, oh, and there it is, by gosh. Oh, a light came up on, on the hammer. Um, I suppose we could be, we'll get rid of your, the, the easy answer to your question is it represents the blows of fate. That's the easy answer. But it's, I think it's more than that. Originally there were five hammer blows in the, uh, in the piece. He uh, added them after he had written the piece because they're written in blue pencil rather than, than ink. Uh, we know that for a fact. And then he took out two of those five. Then he went into rehearsal and took out the third of the, th of, of the three for which the popular um, explanation is he was afraid that that last, that third hammer blow of fate would be his own demise, would represent his own demise. Is, is this just looking back psychologically, reading this in, or was Mahler deliberately putting the hammer in as a representation of two of the tragic uh, elements of his life? You'd have to ask him that. I, 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 I don't think I, I could tell you for sure, um, but obviously it's a pretty compelling um, argument because, yes, we accept three blows of fate as a metaphorical part of our understanding of, of literature and, and so on, and, and at the same time, we know that he was a deeply superstitious man, and so he would have uh, very much been aware of the three blows of fate, if, if that's indeed what it was supposed to mean. I, I put the th hammer blow back because Mahler has already met his demise, so there's no superstition left <laughs> in it. Uh, and I think it works really perfectly in the piece. And besides, I built this hammer, and I want to get three blows out of it, not two in a given night. In fact, this is why Mr. Cooper drove to town instead of flying, because he has to bring the darned thing with him. We, we rented a Ford Expedition. Thank you, Ford. You can put your check in the, in the mail there. Um, the Ford Exposition vehicle to drive the hammer out over three days so that we could have it here in, in New Mexico. That's right. Yeah. 
the first round of applause for the hammer. That's great. Uh, but what we know is that Mahler never once, in the three performances he gave over a few years' time in, in Europe, never once was satisfied with the sound of the hammer. So all we have is a description of what the hammer is supposed to sound like, which is the, the, the sound of an axe felling a tree. Now, the sound of an axe felling a tree at the time when the orchestra is playing, you wouldn't hear that. Uh, because just because of the nature of the, of the acoustic space that we're in. So we have to come up with something that's going to give that kind of effect. It's, he's, he's, he says absolutely not metallic, must not sound metallic, um, which was an important thing too with the Industrial Revolution being what it was. So you're blah, not blah, just blah, blah. doing the plate of metal and banging exactly, on like, it with like it. Exactly, a, like a foundry, an iron foundry. Mm -hmm. It's not an iron foundry kind of thing. It's supposed to be like a tree being felled with this, this massive tree, the tree of life being felled by the, the axe of death. Can, can we go look at this yeah, thing? So, so let's look at it a little bit. So what we need to have is some sort of resonant box. And so the box itself, now you in the audience think this is the hammer, don't you? I mean, that's the hammer. But from a musical point of view, this is the hammer. That's the thing that resonates that is really the hammer. So the box itself is in this green part from the bottom here down to here. These sides go up so I can cut a notch because one thing I don't want to have happen is the thing explode <laughs> under the duress of being struck by the hammer. So I don't know if you can see, but it has the F holes in front. Oh, yeah, beautiful F holes. You see these? This proves that it's a musical instrument. See. Uh, <laughs> Which is, but, but then what you can't see in the shadow, it also has a bass port over here. There's on a bass side. port right here. As you can see, I can push my hand in there. And in fact, I can put PVC pipe and wind it around like Bose speakers to tune it. If, if it were on the floor, but instead what I did was I built this cradle, which raises it off the floor, enabling the sound to emanate out the side. Now, I'm going to hold onto the microphone, which means I'm going to give you a pathetic little one-handed stroke of the hammer. Maybe I won't. The first one was the pathetic one, right? So that sound, I hope you agree, is not metallic. Wow. And um, that's, that's, that's it. Now, th Three hammer blows all the way from West Virginia. That's a and in the concert, uh, obviously, you don't drop the baton and run over here and hammer it. <laughs> Well, so, of course, th that's the magic of the baton. The fact is that if you put that baton down like that, it would sound ten times louder than that. <laughs> Batons are, are very powerful things. We have, a, we have to uh, get off at uh, 5.30, so we have a few minutes left for questions. Does anyone have any? Come on, come on. It's always tough. The first question, always tough. But the answer is no, you cannot play the hammer. <laughs> yeah. Have you used this hammer in other performances already? Yes, I, have, I built this hammer about three years ago for a performance we gave with the West Virginia Symphony Orchestra, and indeed our first flute player walked on stage and said, I want to play that. <laughs> um, it's it's uh, a highly coveted uh, position to play the, play the hammer. Uh, I've done the piece subsequently with orchestras that have their own hammer. Um, and in fact, currently the plan is to put that in the, in the New Mexico Philharmonic's um, hammer storage closet <laughs> on the Knoll Avenue. But did, did there, there, there is another piece, uh, Alban Berg, right? There's a, a question back here. M Mansell? Yeah. Oh, yeah the, the, another piece by Alban Berg is three orchestral pieces, Opus 6, that also used the hammer. But Berg was very much an admirer of Mahler's music, heard this piece, and thought it was the greatest piece of music ever written. Checked with the orchestra, they had a hammer. They had a hammer already. He could put it in. I am not sure if this question was just asked, but I am curious what other pieces of music use hammer? Alban, she was asking what other pieces of music, Alban yeah, Berg. Yeah, the Alban Berg three pieces, and there's also, I think, there might be a piece by Michael Doherty, who's an American composer, who was commissioned to write a short opening piece for Mahler's Sixth Symphony. The piece is 80 minutes, it's shorter than a movie, don't worry, it's not that long. But 80 minutes is, is, is a lot of music, so we need something else on the first half, like in our case, the Schubert. So I think uh, there's been an American composer who has written a piece deliberately using the hammer because he knew that it was conceived as being a, a pre Mahler six piece. Huh. I mean, once you've got the hammer, you might as well use it, right? Yeah. 
especially if you're paying for storage at this mm -hmm. point. Uh, way back there? Yes, I'm really curious. How did you know what to use when you were building this hammer? I mean, well, it depends on whether or not you like the sound. Did well, you like it? We've heard the sound, and it sounds like a tree falling to me. Yeah. And I just wondered, you've got a pretty fancy contraption there. And I'm just wondering, what did you try other things first? The fact is that I had some plywood left over in my garage. <laughs> and some green paint. The green paint came later, but yes, I'd, I'd, I'd actually made a batting machine. There's a, there's a piece by John Philip Sousa called The National Game, a march, which has the sound of a, of a, of a home run being mm -hmm. struck in it. And so I had, I had this uh, metal thing like you put, put in the garden to hang a flower thing, so it stands up about this high. And between that metal thing, I strung a rolling pin with a sole of a shoe, leather thing there, and then a bungee cord through it and tightened like this, and then you hit it with a baseball bat. That's a batting machine. Um, <laughs> But I, had, I bought this green paint. <laughs> and in fact, I painted Stradivarius on that one. But I had the green paint left over. I had the, uh, the plywood left over. And because we don't know what Mahler would have settled with, I don't know whether he'd like the sound or not. He didn't like anything in his own lifetime. It's basically open slather. So we just tried something. I had one clue by watching a DVD on YouTube of the Lucerne Festival performance. And that was where I got the idea of the striking plate. I could see, I couldn't, they, they didn't give you a, a big close-up so you could make measurements and stuff like that, but I could see that he was striking something which would protect the, um, the thing from exploding. Because these other, these other plates here have their own resonance, um, but they, this, this would go through this if you, if you struck it. So you need to have this six by six piece of pressure treated lumber. The length of it, that too was just what was lying around at my house, you know? Do you, you live My next wife to a asked rail? me why I never throw anything out. Marjorie, you're there, right? This is why I never throw anything out. Wow, so this is what you do in your summers. Mahler composed and you create unusual percussion instruments. Yeah. I'm afraid we have to uh, say goodbye. We'd like to thank you for coming and uh, thank Callahan and McLeod for sponsoring these. Tell your friends, the crowds are getting bigger and this is a wonderful ta chance to share. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy the concert. Our thanks to Maestro Grant Cooper. Thank you, everybody.